continuing scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captain of a scientific, technological elite. We've signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Now, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Welcome to today's broadcast of Technocracy News and Trends. Patrick Wood here, Editor-in-Chief. Today is the 20th of September, 2019. In the news today is Baltimore again. Baltimore made headlines back in 2016 for a very super-secret surveillance program that they had implemented that caused a stir all around the country. And they stopped it as a result, but it's back and so the city of Baltimore, again, which is heavy laden with crime, is back at the table again negotiating with the very same company to implement surveillance real-time, full-time, by airplane over the entire city of Baltimore. Of course, they're saying that they're going to stop crime and they're going to cut down on crime, but they're going to have to surveil the entire city to do it. This is a very important story. It's going to set a precedent for the rest of the country. My comments at the top are Baltimore was busted in 2016 for conducting a secret aerial surveillance dragnet of the entire city with a single airplane. Now it's back at the table looking for three airplanes to blanket the city in real time. So they had one airplane before, now they're going for three. And it's the same company. I'll mention that two or three times. The article states, the head of an aerial surveillance company that's the company, same one, is pitching Baltimore officials, I will say again pitching Baltimore officials, on flying not one, which they flew before, but three camera-laden planes above the city simultaneously, covering most of the city and its violent crime, he said in emails obtained by the Baltimore Sun. As a side note, I wonder if this would have remained secret had not the Baltimore Sun somehow acquired the emails that were talking about this. The article continues, A pair of Texas donors have stepped forward to fund three planes and extra police, 40 local analysts, and oversight personnel if there is city buy-in, the records and interviews show. The effort aims to demonstrate the effectiveness of such an all-seeing surveillance system in fighting crimes in the city. The enlarged scope of the three-year, 6.6 .6 million surveillance pitch was welcomed by supporters and denounced, not surprisingly, by detractors contacted by the Sun. Ross McNutt of Ohio-based Persistent Surveillance Systems, that's the same guy that did it in 2016, said in emails to officials in Mayor Bernard C. Jack Young's office, that most city council members had expressed their support for the surveillance planes, though several council members denied it. No decision has been made. I have to make a comment here. I remember the story from 2016 very well. Several city council members back then had no idea that the secret surveillance program was being implemented at that time, and they were absolutely aghast that the city management had kept the city council in the dark. And that was one of the reasons that they scuttled the program back then. The people were just absolutely incensed that they were left out of the loop because that's their responsibility, of course. The article continues. Each plane would be capable of recording up to 32 square miles at a time, and each would fly 45 to 50 hours per week, McNutt said. With these three coverage areas we would be able to cover areas that include 80 to 90 percent of the murders and shootings in Baltimore, McNutt wrote in an email last month to Cheryl Goldstein, Young's deputy chief of staff. 
The work would cost $2.2 million a year, said McNutt, whose company previously flew a single surveillance plane over Baltimore as part of a secret pilot program in 2016. And yes, indeed, it was secret. That funding would convert the cost of putting the planes up, additional police officers to work the cases aided by the surveillance, independent oversight of the program's privacy measures, and a University Baltimore-led evaluation of the program's effectiveness in supporting investigations and deterring crime in the community, McNutt wrote. So, of course, he's pitching it every way that he can. The article continues, McNutt said the program's costs would be covered by Texas philanthropist Laura and John Arnold, who also funded the 2016 pilot program. John Arnold, in a statement, confirmed his strong interest in funding the program, but said nothing is certain yet. While we have not formally committed to additional funding, we have expressed significant interest in a proposal to restart the program if it has support from Baltimore City leaders and the broader community, he said. We will wait to see a formal proposal before making a firm commitment. More needs to be said about these secret funders, Laura and John Arnold, as research becomes available. We'll cover it in the pages of Technocracy News and Trends. In the meantime, the city is moving forward with a completely unconstitutional and possibly illegal surveillance program. The fact that it's funded by private money doesn't mean that it still can't be scrutinized by public interest, because it is, and it certainly should be. We'll leave this story behind and keep our eye on it. There's a video in this story that I put in from 2016 so you can get an idea of exactly what this type of surveillance entails. It is absolutely astounding what they can do with high-resolution cameras and these small airplanes that will simply fly around the city taking pictures constantly from an altitude of somewhere around 10,000 feet means that privacy is absolutely in the tank. The next story is disturbing for those people in Hong Kong for sure. The headline is, China invents handheld sonic weapon for crowd control. I wrote, certain frequencies that do not normally appear in nature in harmful intensities can be used as a potent weapon leading to incapacitation, hearing loss, vomiting, organ damage, and heart attacks. Yet another technocrat solution to social engineering. I'll mention at the beginning of the story that sonic weapons have been around for a long time. They'd been studied by the intelligence community and scientists even back in the early part of the last century. They didn't understand much about how it would affect the human body, the organs of the body, etc. But several countries have actually used sonic weapons against enemies and dissidents. It's been pitched mostly as a crowd control type of device, but now China has apparently miniaturized it to the point where it can be handheld, not mounted on a truck. This type of sonic technology was very possibly what was used in Cuba against diplomats at the U.S. Embassy there, many of whom came down with very horrifying symptoms and had to ultimately leave the country because of it. Scientists and doctors who examined them when they were back in the States said that many had suffered brain damage that they may never recover from. And as this article brings out, those kinds of things can actually happen, and this is very symptomatic of sonic-type weaponry. So the article states, China has developed the first portable sonic gun for riot control, the Chinese Academy of Sciences said. The rifle-shaped instrument which was jointly developed with military and law enforcement, is designed to disperse crowds using focused waves of low-frequency sound, the Academy's Technical Institute of Physics and Chemistry website said on Wednesday. The device's biological effect would cause extreme discomfort with vibrations in the eardrums, eyeballs, stomach, liver, and brain, scientists said. Studies dating back to the 1940s found that low-frequency sound energy could, depending upon intensity and exposure, cause, now listen to the symptoms, dizziness, headaches, vomiting, 
bowel spasms, involuntary defecation, organ damage, and heart attacks. Sonic weapons are typically large and have to be mounted on vehicles until the Chinese development, which has no moving parts, they were powered by electricity to drive a magnetic coil to generate energy. This meant they needed a large and stable source of power. The Chinese government launched a sonic weapon program in 2017, and its conclusion is unlikely to be related to the months of anti-government protests in Hong Kong. Professor Zi Ziwan, lead scientist on the project, said the device was powered by a tube-shaped vessel containing an inert gas. When heated, the gas particles vibrate and a deep, monotonous sound is emitted. The prototype has passed field and third-party tests, and the project team has completed its assessment of the device's effects on the body, the Academy said. This is pretty disturbing and probably will be used on the protesters in Hong Kong if they continue to take to the streets like they have in past weeks. China is completely intent on managing its dissident problem, not only in China, but in Hong Kong as well. We'll keep an eye on this story. This is certainly a technology that's going to be retrofitted by governments around the world. If the Chinese can do it and they know how they can do it, then other governments will emulate. You know that in our country, organizations like DARPA and IARPA will certainly jump on the bandwagon to get their own low-frequency sonic weapons, and heaven help us if they start using these types of things on protesters and resistors around the country because they could end up with very serious health issues. The last story is in the news cycle right now all over the world. The headline is, Deceived Schoolchildren Take to the Streets in Global Climate Strike. And yes, today is the day for the global climate strike around the world where school children are cutting school to hold posters and placards on streets to get news photo ops where they can essentially guilt people into supporting their climate change agenda. Now, let's be clear. Children as young as six, seven, eight years old have no idea what the climate agenda is, but they have been told that they have no future and that they will most certainly die young because they have no future. And their only answer that they can have is to take these signs and go out and say, please save our future. I wrote at the top of this article, psychological child abuse at the hands of sociopathic adults is as twisted and evil as is physical abuse. When kids are fed propaganda that they're going to die if they don't strike for global warming, it's time for the rest of us to say, Enough already. One 15-year-old states below, and I'll read the article in a second, quote, We believe there is no point in going to school if we are not going to have a future to live in, close quote. These young kids have no ability or tools to understand reality, and they are being mercilessly used to further the global warming hysteria of climate extremists. It is not a mistake that the only solution ever offered is sustainable development, a.k.a. technocracy. This article states, Vast crowds of children skip school Friday to join a global strike against climate change, heeding the rallying cry of teen activist Greta Thunberg and demanding adults act to stop environmental disaster. Now, we've covered the activities and antics of Greta Thunberg elsewhere in the pages of Technocracy News and Trends. She apparently is the young person who's leading the charge on this global strike, but has grown way beyond just her. The article continues, It was expected to be the biggest protest ever against a threat posed to the planet by climate change. Yelling slogans and waving placards, children and adults across Asia and the Pacific kicked off the protest which spread later to Africa and Europe with huge crowds filling the streets. We are the future. We are school children, and we are not going to school, said one student, 15, protesting in Delhi. We believe there is no point in going to school 
if we're not going to have a future to live in. Organizers forecast 1 million participants overall. In Australia alone, they said more than 300,000 children, parents, and supporters rallied. Stop climate change now. There's no plan B. Wake up, read some of the signs brandished by demonstrators in a trendy central shopping district of Tokyo. We adults caused the planet emergency, said one of them, Chika Maruta, 32, marching with her colleagues from a cosmetics company. We should take our responsibilities for the next generation. Swedish schoolgirl Thunberg, 16, has accused leaders of not doing enough to prevent harmful climate change. On the eve of the strikes, she insisted solutions were being ignored. Everything counts. What you do counts, she said in a video message to supporters. Demonstrators, young and old, echoed her cry. We have to reduce our carbon footprints to pretty much nothing in the next 12 years. Otherwise, there will be drastic consequences, said 15-year-old Jonathan Lithgow, one of the 500 children and adults demonstrating in Johannesburg. He said his school gave students permission to take part in the march. The demonstrations were due to culminate in New York, where 1.1 million students in around 1,800 public schools have been permitted to skip school. Of course, only in New York could that happen. It continues, as the sun rose over the international dateline, events began in the deluge-threatened Pacific islands of Vanuatu, the Solomons, and Kiribati, where children chanted, We are not sinking, we are fighting. There was a similar sense of defiance across Asia. We are the future and deserve better, 12-year-old Lily, known as Thailand's Greta, for her campaigning against plastic bags in malls, told AFP in Bangkok. The adults, quote, have just been talking about it, but they're not doing anything, she said. We don't want excuses. In Australia... Some local authorities, schools, and businesses encourage people to take part in the strikes. The changing environment has become a daily fact of life in Australia. Struck in recent years by droughts, more intense bushfires, devastating floods, and the blanching of the Great Barrier Reef. I have to stop and I just can't read any more of this. It's nonsense perpetuating lies that have been debunked thoroughly over the last couple of years. And yet, these climate alarmists are using these children, marching them out front as a shield almost, saying, see, even the children recognize that we're going to die if we don't do something about climate change. Well, these children know nothing about climate change. They don't understand. They don't have the capacity to understand even what they're talking about. They're simply imitating what their adult coaches are doing. And they're making these claims and verbalizations to elicit sympathy from the larger audience who are not currently involved. The people that are supporting this type of psychological child abuse should be ashamed of themselves. And the people who are standing around watching them that are not part of it, they should be telling them that they should be ashamed. This is absolutely patently ridiculous The emotional scars that they're developing today may stay with them for the rest of their life. This is so wrong. If you have a beef with climate science and you want to do something about it and you're an adult and you want to walk the street with a sign or any other silly costume you might wear, that's fine. Go do it. But leave the children out of it. They don't deserve that from anybody and they certainly don't deserve to be told they're going to die, so what's the point of even going to school? That is just mean-spirited and cruel to children. Well, I'm Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. We'll see you next time. 